to start in just one moment. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things before we do so. Um, the first is, again, the sign-up for the visit to the Atom Institute next Monday. Uh, the sign-up sheets are still posted on the walls. If you intend to join us for the visit next Monday, please ensure that there's a cross or a tick or a check beside your name. Later today, we will put up a revised list, and if your name is not on that list, then you are not going to the Atom Institute. So uh, please ensure that if you're intending to join us, that you put that cross next to your name. Uh, the other issue I just want to uh, raise is that today and tomorrow, we will have a virtual reality movie uh, available for viewing out beside where the coffee area is. It's called Collisions. 
and it's a, um, a very innovative film on nuclear testing history in Australia, which uses VR headsets, and you're all welcome to have a look at that. They're, they will be available between 12.30 uh, and 1.30 today, and 12pm uh, and 1pm uh, tomorrow. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue with our deep delve into the world of CDBT technologies. Uh, first of all, with a uh, presentation and discussion on radionuclide particulate and noble gas monitoring technologies, with our colleagues here, uh, Jim Matilla, uh, Romano uh, Plenteda, and Barbara Nadelud. And we will move straight from that into the data processing and analysis side of things with Abdel Hakim Gedu. So I'm just going to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome back. And uh, yeah, so as Cormac mentioned, we're uh, continuing where we left off with you yesterday afternoon, and uh, we're going to talk about now on the uh, radionuclide side of uh, of the IMS business, and uh, so. Uh, you know, this is the other part of when uh, we talked about the uh, pressure and seismic waves in the uh, earth and in the atmosphere yesterday, and today we're going to uh, talk about the systems that have been developed that now take advantage of the release of the radionuclide uh, gas and particulate that results uh, from nuclear testing, and uh, so we'll go into some descriptions on these specialized systems that uh, collect and analyze uh, uh, these materials and as well as the uh, laboratories and processes that result in us uh, putting together the uh, high quality uh, data that results from all of these activities. So uh, just a, a quick uh, snapshot on the network, you know, of the, uh, we have 69 of the 80 radionuclide particulate systems certified today and there's a couple more in the pipeline uh, which means either uh, one being certified this year and a couple that are in the process of being established. So there's only uh, just a handful, uh, eight left to, uh, uh, to get started on establishing. Uh, in terms of the noble gas, we have 25 of 40 certified and uh, six others installed. And then we have on the laboratories, we have 13 of 16 that are certified and uh, we're making progress on those remaining ones. So there's been a lot of good activity in all of these and uh, so without further ado, let me uh, uh, pass the floor to my uh, colleague Romano to my right and he'll start off the briefing. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim, and good morning, distinguished guests, uh, delegates. Um, I will try to uh, provide uh, in my presentation a bit of a uh, glance about uh, generic nuclear test signatures, the radionuclide components of the international monitoring system. Yesterday you saw the waveform components, and then uh, the radionuclide technology um, overview of uh, the radionuclide station, what is a radionuclide station, the different components of it and a bit of quality insurance and quality control, and uh, my colleague Barbara Nadalut will also talk about the laboratory network. So, as you know, the international monitoring system, one of the third body of the international monitoring system is the, the oh, sorry, oh, the CTBT is the international monitoring system, which comprises of uh, 321 stations for the fourth technology but also 16 radionuclide laboratories uh, and the, their function uh, I'm going to explain uh, later on in this uh, presentation. And of course, uh, um, we need uh, the aid of the global communication infrastructure, which is responsible to bring uh, the data from the station to the IDC, the International Data Center. And of course, also to the indices, to the uh, national uh, data centers. The requirements uh, um, at entering to force the big uh, target is the data availability, which means uh, uh, good data uh, coming to the ADC. And uh, we have different uh, target, 98% for the waveform and 95% for the radionuclide. Which uh, translate in downtime per station uh, for the radionuclide 
in one year, no more than seven days total for the waveform and 15 days total for the radionuclide and no more than seven days consecutive. You already saw, yes, sorry. You already saw the map of the distributed uh, uh, stations all over the globe. Part of this, uh, and uh, um, you saw this, uh, you will see this uh, in this uh, strange flower that we have here in the radionuclides. Those are 80. 40 of those are also equipped um, with the noble gas technology, and we will go in detail on this. Why we are doing this? Why we are covering with these four technologies? <clears throat> Basically, when we have a three possible scenario of nuclear testing, atmospheric test, the underwater test, and the underground test. In the atmospheric test, the main technology which uh, will detect uh, such an explosion are infrasound wave, and yesterday you got uh, um, a debriefing on this, but also seismic and hydroacoustic waves as a sec secondary waves. In this case, uh, we will have a full release of uh, fission products and activating product, activation products in the atmosphere. This is the most easier uh, to detect, test to detect for us. The underwater test, uh, instead, as a primary technology, we'll have hydroacoustic wave, and of course, as a secondary, also seismic infrasound waves. Now here the release of uh, fission and uh, uh, activation products is partial, is to go, is to travel from the, um, the the underwater cavity, but also under in into the water, and uh, we expect a partial release of noble gas and maybe some potential release of particulates. In the underground test, which is uh, the most common, and this is what we had experienced since uh, a few years uh, in DPRK, um, the main uh, technology able to uh, detect the test is, and, and this was the case, is the seismic. But of course, we can have also some hydroacoustic if it's close to the shore, and infrasound wave if, for instance, is uh, the underground test is done under uh, inside the mountain where you have uh, this possibility to have also this kind of uh, um, physics released into the atmosphere. Also here in the underground test <coughs> we have a partial or potential partial release of noble gas into the atmosphere. It will be very unlikely unless the cavity completely collapsed to have a release of particulate. So in the waveform as we saw uh, yesterday, we have uh, 50 primaries, so I, I will not go through much uh, in this one, 50 primary, 120 auxiliary, you know already what is the role of the auxiliary uh, station. Hydroacoustic, we have 11 and 16 for sound station. But on the radionuclide, uh, is the only technology which uh, can uh, uh, assess that this explosion was uh, of a nuclear ma um, uh, uh, matter, and uh, we have, uh, as I said, 80 radionuclide station in total, and 16 uh, radionuclide laboratories, uh, which we're all are going to explain later. But let, let's see a bit of uh, the physics behind uh, uh, the explosion and why uh, we're interested in... Oops, sorry. So what happened during a nuclear weapon test? During uh, the fission, and uh, fission is always a component, whether the bomb is fusion or just fission bomb. There will be always a component in fission. 85% of the energy is released into the blast, shock and heat. And because of the blast and the shock, this is where the seismic or other waveform component uh, are playing a big role. But 15% of the energy is released in radiation, 5% of which is prompt, so we are not going to detect uh, this, uh, uh, this, this part of the physics, but 10% of the residual uh, energy is released uh, through the decay of the activation and fission product, which, uh, if they travel into the atmosphere and they reach our station, will be uh, then detected and, 
and, uh, and therefore we could assess if uh, this uh, come from this uh, blast. So aerosol-borne particulate and gaseous fission products, uh, as I was uh, uh, explaining before, if uh, the uh, explosion happens in the air or eventually underwater, there is a chance, there is a big chance in the air, but there is also a chance underwater that some particulates will uh, uh, travel outside uh, the water or in the air, and this will be transported until our station is detecting that. But in the case of under, um, uh, underground tests, uh, the noble gas are our uh, uh, tracer, because being noble gas are immune uh, and are not uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, interacting to any other materials uh, surrounding, and uh, eventually they will find the way out into cracks and coming out uh, from, uh, from the ground. So we divide the IMS radionuclear technology mainly in two big uh, families, the one for particulate monitoring and the one for noble gas monitoring which uh, um, uh, comply to uh, aerosol sampling, so in the particulate and also in the noble gas, there is a big um, sampling, a lot of air volume, which is sampled. In the case of a particulate monitoring, then uh, uh, the technology able to detect is gamma spectroscopy, and we will talk about in detail about this. On the xenon sampling, there is gamma spectroscopy, but uh, uh, more and more a combination of gamma spectroscopy and beta gamma spectroscopy. Going back to the noble gas, uh, what is the noble gas uh, th which come from uh, the blast uh, or that are induced in the blast from the blast, which are of interest for us? We uh, need to assess that uh, this was a recent nuclear explosion and uh, during uh, as a fission product we have mainly two gas, krypton and xenon and uh, we also have argon as induced from neutron induced uh, uh, product uh, from the calcium which is uh, inside the underground. So depending if you have uh, a, a amount of calcium, of course this is not the case for uh, uh, in air explosion, then you may also have uh, argon uh, 37, which is uh, a byproduct, as you can see here from uh, in this uh, reaction, neutron alpha and then argon 37. But uh, krypton, uh, which is a very good uh, indication of fission, of course, but unfortunately is half life, which is the time uh, to reduce himself by. Uh, by factor two is very big, is 10 years. And uh, this means that uh, detecting krypton doesn't mean that this fission uh, um, happened recently. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, as you probably saw in the globe that is uh, uh, shown uh, in, the, in the ground floor here, we have a lot, we had more than 2,000 explosions during uh, uh, the last decades and there are still krypton around. We have krypton also in the reproduction, in the reprocessing facilities. So this uh, krypton signature is all the time everywhere. It will not help us to assess that it is a fresh release. Uh, argon, of course, is um, in certain condition is a possibility. So it's used, but uh, it's very difficult to measure. It's is uh, because of, uh, of uh, for eye sensitivity. And this is mainly used for OSI application. Xenon is a very good tracer for us. We have a lot of isotopes of xenon, but four of those fall in a very good range of half-lives, not too big to be confused from a, a past test and not too, uh, too short uh, in order to allow the xenon to reach the station before completely decayed out. And we have four isotopes, which are falling in terms of half-life between 9.1 hours and 11.8 days. So our noble gas in the IMS uh, is, uh, is the xenon. 
So how do we design uh, the network? The treaty goal of the IMS radionuclide station is 90% detection probability within 40 days after the blast of uh, one kiloton nuclear explosion anywhere in the globe. How do we translate that in uh, station sensitivity? Uh, a radionuclide release from one kiloton nuclear weapon range between 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 becquerel. Becquerel is a decay per second. And uh, uh, release for the key nuclides, which are barium-140 on the particulate and the xenon-133 for the noble gas. In underground nuclear explosion, we estimate that uh, only one per mil, one percent of this, of this uh, um, uh, radionuclide release is released in the atmosphere. This means that uh, our stations, our network, needs to be able to detect the release of 10 to the 13 becquerel in the most conservative way anywhere on the globe. Based on this, uh, uh, the radionuclide station network has been designed with 80 particulate radionuclide station, uh, 40 of which uh, have a noble gas detection, and the sensitivity is much, much smaller. We are talking about uh, uh, 16 order of magnitude lower, which is going from 10 to 1,000 millibecquerel per cubic meter. And this is due to the fact that the air from the blast point is, of course, diluting while traveling. And so we need to be much more sensitive when the air arrive, reach the station. This is a, sub, uh, a picture of the sub-network only for of the IMS, only for the radionuclide. The yellow station are the stations which are uh, equipped only with particulate monitoring, while the red one are the combined technology, noble gas and particulate. But let me go now a bit in more in detail on the different technology. So the family of the particulate radionuclide monitoring comprise of a, a sampler, which is just a simple air pump, air compressor, which is uh, sucking the air for 24 hours into a filter. This, uh, we have different technology, I'm going to uh, a different solution for this, uh, and I will go to, to show a bit more on this, but mainly it's very uh, common to have a filter, which is a paper filter, uh, which is collecting uh, the particulate uh, in 24 hours with a very big volume, we're talking about 12,000 uh, uh, cubic meter. This filter then is translated into a decay chamber, a decay position, because a lot of the particulate which are coming into the filter are background, and those are radon daughter, which is always in the air, and depending on the station location can be much more or less, but likely this is short-lived, and the 24 hours is, is a compromise to let this big background, which is constitute a big noise for our detector, to decay out as much as possible, but not to lose the relevant nuclide. So 24 hours is a decay. And then after 24 hours, the filter is translated to the uh, high purity uh, gamma detector, is a germanium. And we need to have a very high resolution because a lot of lines for the relevant nuclide are very close to each other. And also not relevant nuclides, but also a lot of background nuclides are close to the relevant nuclides. So we need to resolve in energy very well this, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, nuclides. And then after the filter sits for 24 hours, so we have 24 hours of sampling, 24 hours of decay, and 24 hours of uh, uh, acquisition into a detector, then this is moved to archive. The data that are uh, collected uh, from, uh, the, by, by the gamma detector are then converted into a, a format which is standardized for the CTBT, and, the for, and these data are uh, moved together with the state of health data through the, the GCI to Vienna. And from Vienna, 
will be also available real time to the NDCs. But on data processing, there will be a consequent presentation which we're going to talk a bit more in detail on this. Okay, so here I can show a bit of a detailed picture on a sampler. This is a, a Snow White, it's a Finnish design um, where the air comes from outside into this uh, uh, cover. This cover is done in order to avoid uh, direct uh, exposure to the filter to nastier conditions like sand, uh, high pollution, uh, snow, and so on. Although we have also uh, other version of this one to cope with this harsh condition. Then the filter is translated, it's, it's compressed into a geometry which is very close to the detector. And then it's translated to the K position and then it's moved into the detector. Here is a, a, a view from the top of the detector. The detector sits into a shielding, which is used to reduce as much as possible the background radiation from outside the filter. And the filter sits into a filter holder to be sure that uh, the geometry is always the same every day. What is important is, uh, of course, the chain of custody for this filter. So the filter is uh, uh, followed all the time with a barcode before when it was uh, in the sampling position, in, some, in sampling geometry, but also after it is folded. You can see again, this is a manual station where the operator is removing the filter and moving to the decay position and then to the, after folding also to the detector position. But we also have automatic system. This is a Cinderella, which is a filter which is translating with a robot arm, which also cuts the filters and pile up in a round geometry, again, very close to the detector geometry. On the far right here, we see, oops, we see also another kind of filter, which is um, for another automatic, full automatic uh, uh, system, which is a RASA in American design, which uh, the filter translates uh, in automatic without even being uh, uh, cut anymore, but goes around the detector. All this, uh, all this uh, system needs to uh, comply to a minimum requirement. And the minimum requirement for uh, the uh, particular station is the airflow, which has to be more than 500 uh, uh, cubic meter per hour. The collection time should be 24 hours. We have a collection efficiency, both for uh, the sampler and for the filters. Um, the decay time, the measurement time, the kind of uh, detector that we need. We were talking about high resolution before. The efficiency, minimum efficiency of this detector which is the, the range of energy which should include all the relevant uh, key line, sorry, the key line for all the relevant isotope, and the calibration range that we want, and also the other auxiliary data which is used for uh, a state of health or to assess that the system is working properly. Uh, part of this is the meteorological data and also the baseline sensitivity, which is uh, the sensitivity for this famous barium 140 in the case of the particulate, and also uh, the time before reporting. This is a very important, it's 72 hours, and also the data availability, which we already discussed before. So what happened uh, in time? We have a sampling at the station, the station after the, the detector acquired the spectrum, the spectrum file are then sent to the, the IDC, the IDC are analyzing the spectrum, and this is a typical gamma spectroscopy. You can see a lot of lines very close to each other, that's why we need a very high resolution in energy. The spectrum is analyzed, is categorized, this is a very important step, and the categorization depends if uh, in the spectra relevant nuclides are found, or if uh, background nuclides are found, but in an anomalous concentration. 
After the spectra are categorized and depending on the category, in automatic and also in manual modes, atmospheric transport is, uh, uh, is run, which is uh, use, of course, uh, real data, but models also, and this is trying to look uh, backwards in time a possible source term if a relevant nuclide has been found, but also there are modeling which are going in forward to look a possible new second hit in, a, in another station while we are going in time. For instance, after the DPRK, the forward modeling has been used a lot, but IDC will tell a bit more of this. Let me go now on the noble gas part. The noble gas uh, is uh, a very complex uh, uh, system. It is, while the particulate is being used everywhere in the world, especially for national uh, monitoring, but the noble gas is a very uh, city bit oriented. It is started uh, around 15 years ago. The requirements are very strong. It should be uh, completely full automatic processing. It is xenon oriented, so the development of a technology which uh, is are able to separate this very nuclide from other has been ad hoc tailor made for the CTBT. Of course, the national monitoring is now using also this kind of system, but the system really started uh, through an experiment which is called INGE, International Noble Gas Experiment, and uh, which was divided in three phases from the very R&D and prototyping to a phase where we are doing field tests. We are in phase three of the INGE still, although many stations have been already certified, but um, uh, mainly the, uh, the noble gas system is improving all the time and we are now in the next generation of the noble gas system. But let me go back now to this slide. Here we have uh, the sampling of, uh, of the air in the air now, it doesn't go to a filter, of course, because uh, we are uh, looking for noble gas, but it goes into the gas processing. And this gas processing is very complex, and it goes in many stages, um, where we start removing the water, CO2, and radon, uh, but also nitrogen, other components, which are, of course, all the time in the air. And this is used a different, very different technology. Uh, freeze traps, molecular sleeves, or activated charcoal. And now we are using uh, pressure swing absorbers. Um, so we have different system with different technology to separate it. But the final product, as much as possible, is the high concentration of xenon. Remember that xenon is always present in the air, and this is good. We have uh, eight per million of this uh, uh, component which means that we are always bringing xenon into the uh, detector cell. And this is the stable xenon, is not the radioactive xenon, and eventually will be also radioactive components of this gas into the cell. This is very important that we are monitoring xenon, stable xenon all the time, because the amount of stable xenon that is into the cell, which is calculated, represent also the amount of air that has been sampled. And also, the state of health uh, monitoring that our system is working fine. Um, then this xenon is uh, quantified and then moved into a detector, which uh, can be of a pure gamma spectroscopy, but more and more we are moving we are already in, uh, in some system, but more and more, even the pure gamma spectroscopy system are now moving to beta gamma. And this because uh, the xenon uh, emits in the same time an electron a, or a beta and uh, in the gamma or an X-ray. So the coincidence of these two will be able to reduce very much the sensitivity level, so to, to increase the sensitivity level, to reduce a very low quantity and discard radiation that are coming from outside, which are always bringing uh, signals. This is what uh, it is present as of today in, this, in the, the network. We have a SPALAC system, which we also have in the roof here. And I don't know if there are some tours uh, provided. Um, this is a French design, which uh, the current version is using a pure gamma spectroscopy, 
But the next generation of this is already using a beta detector, which is a silicon pin. Then we have a sauna detector, which is a Swedish uh, design. This comprises of two lines, which are working in alternate mode. And those are, uh, this is using a gamma spectroscopy, so a gamma, spe uh, gamma detector, which is sodium iodine, and also a plastic beta detector. And this uh, below here is an ARIX um, system, which is uh, basically using similar technology, similar physics than the sauna, but this never reached a certification uh, level. Um, and this is installed uh, uh, in Russia. Okay, let me go. Now on the requirement for the noble gas, which are different from uh, the particulate, and here I'm not going in the detail, but you see that we are talking about much lower um, uh, air sampling because uh, xenon is much more sensitive in that, in that respect. So we have a total volume of sample of 10 cubic meter. This is the requirement. There are systems which are reaching much more than that. 24 hours at least, less than 24 hours collection time, but we are system which in the new, in the new generation are reaching six hours. This is very important to reduce to the, um, the time, the acquisition, the sampling time, because a high resolution in time means high sensitivity and the possibility to discriminate much more the different isotopes. Time of reporting here is more strict, it's 48 hours. We don't have the decay part as we have uh, in the particulate. And the isotope that we need to measure are these four. 131M, 133M, 133, 133, and 135. While uh, 133 is the most pro predominant normally coming from the fission pro as a fission product. And also here the other uh, requirement like the 95% data availability. I was talking about a natural background component, uh, and mainly the natural background component uh, are uh, more heating uh, our particulate system. We are talking about uh, lines which are coming from the ground, depending on where you are. If you are close to a volcanic uh, soil, for instance, we have a lot of uranium-238 uh, and thorium-232, which are directly shining through, but also provide the radon dot. The radon is another noble gas which is coming out and eventually is decaying in uh, uh, other uh, nuclides which are collecting to our particulate filter. But as I was saying before, those are short-lived, likely, so through the decay we can reduce uh, uh, sensibly the, the amount of this. And this is the lead to 12. But also we have uh, sodium 40, and from the atmosphere coming down, uh, we have beryllium-7 all the time. This is a very important nuclide for us to assess the quality of our system. There will be no filter without uh, beryllium-7. If, the, if there are filters without beryllium-7, this means that there is a problem. But we also have uh, activation of water uh, so with sodium-22 from cosmic ray uh, and, and, and sodium-24. But of course, these are the natural background, but we also have man-made back, uh, background, which are coming from medical application. And this is very much a problem for the xenon part, but also industrial application, nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear accidents, of course. Uh, if, uh, if you remember Fukushima, uh, the network was very much um, affected uh, by the release of Fukushima. Especially because, as I was saying, we are very sensitive, so we go very much down in uh, concentration. And of course, we have a lot of nuclear tests uh, which are coming from the 50s and the 60s, which are uh, providing constantly still a bit of radioactivity. And this we consider background radioactivity, both natural and man-made. <coughs> so the job of the IDC is to uh, look at these lines, make sure that these lines are all identified, and also make sure that the lines are correctly quantified. So at the end, our final product is a concentration. 
And to make sure that the concentration is coming in as it should, so to make sure that we have high confidence of, uh, why it's moving? Okay, of uh, our uh, measurement, we need to have uh, a quality assurance plan in place, uh, which uh, <coughs> means uh, a very good uh, calibration of the detector, a very good calibration of our all the, our measurement for volume measurement, because concentration also includes volumes, but not only that one. Also, the way we are uh, um, reviewing the data, and we are using in the quality assurance plan, uh, we are going from the station through the certification process to uh, the laboratory, which is uh, the final uh, uh, third body which is uh, benchmarking our station. And uh, Barbara will talk a, a bit more on this one. But of course, quality assurance uh, means uh, quality control at the end. And we have uh, a plan uh, during the year to have uh, uh, filters sent to the laboratory, but also the laboratory itself are undergoing to a continuous uh, uh, proficiency test exercise uh, and so on. So we, what our goal is to have good quality which means uh, high data availability and timeliness, high precision, high accuracy, high sensitivity, but also chain of custody. We need to be sure that uh, our measurement is uh, the filter that comes from the station is the one that reached the laboratory, and uh, we can always reproduce the result on the go. So our quality assurance and consequence quality control is uh, uh, um, basically when we uh, establish the station, we need to have a quality baseline on the station, which means uh, making a site survey that the place where the station uh, sits is, uh, is um, according to the requirements so of free air, free space. <coughs> um, we would like to have uh, not so much background in, on site. And then when the site survey is positive, we start building the station with the criteria that uh, we have set in our uh, quality assurance, but also in the requirement of the, of the treaty. Station certification, but uh, doesn't mean that we stop there. Every time there is a problem, like uh, uh, an upgrade of the station, or if we need to relocate the station, we go through the same process of session certification, which we call station revalidation. And then the same things we do for the laboratory. We certify the laboratory and we survey the laboratory, and Barbara will talk about this. On the station operator uh, operation, we, look, we do daily check, we do daily quality check, we look at the state of health, which is very important, but we also use quality controlled source, which is translated close to the detector of the time, and which, which uh, will give us uh, the health, the status of the health of the detector. And of course, uh, analysts in the ADC will help us in assessing that the detector is still on, inside the specs, and is uh, that uh, our data can be trusted. And part of the station operator is also a periodic or irregular check through laboratory reanalysis of the filter. We're talking about this beryllium-7. The beryllium-7 is a fantastic uh, state of health nuclide for us, and we will uh, uh, periodically send the filter to the laboratory that will remeasure this beryllium-7 to see if there are uh, consistency with the station. But also here, we receive feedback from the NDCs, and we do performance tests. Station certification, but also laboratory certification, certification requirements are um, following ISO standards, uh, which are translating more tailor-made for the uh, CTBT into inf paper. We have uh, three inf paper, depending on particulate, novel gas, and laboratory. Uh, if paper are also in continuous review, as ISO is in continuous review. So we had, uh, there, were, there was a recent uh, update of the ISO 17025, and now we are in the process of updating uh, our INF paper in this. And this includes everything, uh, validation of calibration, airflow measurement, accuracy check, uh, power outage, detector parameter. This is all the tests that we are doing at the station before we certify or we revalidate. And this uh, certification comprising a certification visit, uh, but also four continuous months of data 
to assess that the station is performing well. And now I will give uh, to Barbara the floor to talk about the IMS Radinoclide Laboratory Network. Good morning. So I will take over from uh, my colleague Romano, but uh, I will make a lot of references to his uh, uh, talk from uh, uh, today. So let's start uh, with uh, a smooth uh, transition, and before getting into the uh, laboratory topic, uh, let's uh, have uh, a quick look, uh, because then more detail will come in the IDC uh, presentations. But uh, let's have a quick look at the um, characterization of the CTBT samples. So the uh, spectrum, uh, raw data, raw spectra, are the final product uh, uh, which is delivered from the station to the uh, IDC in Vienna, where spectra are received, analyzed, interactively uh, reviewed by analysts. Based on this, uh, there is a, a categorization that for particulate sample is uh, uh, based on five uh, levels. So in case, uh, as Romano already anticipated, uh, uh, there is a presence uh, of some uh, uh, non-anthropogenic natural uh, radionuclides, uh, the sample will be categorized as uh, level one or level two, depending if these radionuclides are typical for this station or not. In case uh, uh, there is a presence of uh, anthropogenic nuclides, we also need to check if they are typical for the station. A simple example is uh, cesium-137 is really expected to be seen in European stations. So it's typical, is always present as a, a, a product from a Chernobyl accident. So uh, the category is a level three, nothing atypical, nothing anomalous. If uh, the uh, anthropogenic nuclide is not typical of a station, then uh, the sample is raised to level four. If uh, we uh, identify uh, more than one anthropogenic uh, nuclide in a, in a sample, then uh, uh, we go to uh, a level five. I anticipated this because it's strictly connected to the role of laboratories. So if we look now at uh, the uh, network, the role of uh, the laboratories is sample reanalysis. Uh, they have been, uh, uh, these uh, 16 radionuclide laboratories have been uh, uh, identified uh, to support uh, uh, the uh, IMS network of stations. What is exactly, what are these laboratories doing and why are they reanalyzing uh, and when they are, are they reanalyzing uh, uh, samples? One of the roles is uh, uh, to uh, confirm the results of the routine analysis of sample from IMS stations, which is uh, a part of the already mentioned QA, QC program. So um, among uh, uh, level one to level four uh, uh, samples, there is a random selection, and uh, every year, four uh, samples from each radionuclide certified station uh, are sent to different laboratories for a uh, reanalysis with a purpose to verify that uh, the station is performing well and that uh, the uh, spectra uh, produced by the station are uh, producing uh, a good, uh, good quality uh, of data. Then we also uh, happen sometimes, and this uh, mainly uh, refers to uh, level five samples. We uh, identify uh, some uh, anthropogenic nuclides, but uh, we need to be sure that these nuclides uh, are in the physical sample. Don't forget that uh, we have a final product, which is the raw spectrum coming from the station where the physical sample is analyzed but we also have the physical sample, the paper filter compressed, which is measured at the station. So it's uh, really the same importance shall be given to confirming uh, either the present presence or also the absence. Uh, because in case we expect to see some nuclides and we don't see them, uh, we need to check that they are really not in the sample. And 
and that we don't have problems in the measuring system. On the other side, when we identify the presence of some relevant uh, nuclides, we need to be sure that uh, these nuclides are really in the sample. One just practical example, we had a case in a station there was a, a, an issue with uh, the quality check source. Every day there is a short measurement made uh, with uh, a small quality uh, assurance source which uh, contains uh, cesium-137 and cobalt 60 They are both uh, relevant uh, CTBT relevant nuclides, but they are just used for this short measurement and then they are taken out from the uh, measurement chamber. Uh, there was a leakage and uh, uh, the measurement chamber was contaminated with these nuclides. So in the spectra coming to the ADC, we could see cobalt-60 and cesium-137. But uh, by remeasuring the sample, we could confirm that uh, these uh, nuclides uh, were detected from the contaminated chamber and they were not present in the physical sample, which is really important because it means that we are not present in air. So they were not uh, released in air. Uh, and this is uh, mainly uh, the, the role. Uh, what happens when uh, in IDC we uh, categorize as level 5 spectrum? Uh, the PTS is uh, uh, sending instructions to the station, and the station operator will uh, take this uh, sample, will uh, split it uh, in two half samples, and uh, will send uh, each half of uh, the sample to a different laboratory. So in this case, uh, two laboratories will be involved. Uh, we will have uh, two independent uh, remeasurements uh, of a sample to be compared. So uh, another not minimum role, especially in the past, it was extremely uh, useful of the laboratories is uh, to act as backup uh, for the measurement of station samples in case there is a problem with a measurement system at the station. In this case, uh, it happened that uh, one detector broke and uh, uh, the replacement detector took uh, uh, a lot of time. And meanwhile, the station was sending uh, the collective spectra to the laboratory who was measuring them on a daily basis and providing, the, uh, providing raw spectra, in this case, uh, to the IDC. So let's go ahead. Uh, so the question is, we understand the really importance uh, in, uh, of the role of the laboratories in quality assurance for our network, but the question is uh, who, who is assessing the assessor? So uh, PTS needs to be very, very uh, uh, careful in uh, uh, assuring the high quality standards in the deliveries from the uh, laboratories. And for this purpose, we have in place a, a process, a program, which is the PTE program. Every year, we make some proficiency text exercises for all the 16 laboratories. So we provide some reference samples, and we mainly test the laboratory ability to correctly identified the uh, nuclides which are in the test sample provided, and also to measure uh, accurately their uh, activity. Uh, we have a grading scheme, and based on the uh, performance of uh, the laboratory, there might be, in some cases, uh, some corrective actions which are required by PTS, and uh, which uh, shall be performed by the laboratory uh, in order to uh, ensure the high quality standards. Uh, based on the uh, laboratory results, uh, there might be minor corrective action which don't uh, affect significantly the quality of level of the uh, final product delivered by the laboratory, or there might be some major critical uh, issues. In this case, uh, the laboratory is suspended and uh, will be allowed to measure again uh, samples coming from certified IMS stations only after the corrective actions are performed, uh, accepted by PTS, uh, and uh, the laboratory is uh, revalidated. Here you can see uh, again uh, the, uh, the three different uh, types of uh, particulate samples from the 
diff three different uh, types uh, of station, which are the Manuel, the Arame or Cinderella, and the Rasa. And uh, uh, the typical PT samples, uh, which are sent to laboratories as part of the proficiency text uh, exercises, are uh, usually in the same matrix and geometry of the uh, uh, samples coming from uh, IMS uh, stations. In uh, some cases, in previous year, we had uh, some uh, simulated spectra which were sent uh, to the laboratories instead of a physical sample to be measured, which uh, were meant uh, to test mainly the ability of an analyst uh, to um, analyze uh, and uh, correctly identify and uh, accurately uh, and precisely quantify the nuclides uh, presence uh, in the spectrum. Recently, we had uh, a mainly, a, we, we could achieve some very complex spectra, which were really challenging the laboratory analysts uh, by irradiating some uh, samples, which was also very, very interesting and demanding exercise for the laboratories. Uh, I, I would just like to add that uh, over these 18 years uh, of uh, quality assurance program, the laboratories uh, are now demonstrating a very, very high uh, standard in their performance and in their deliveries. And actually, we are at the point now that uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, we are almost uh, working the other way around because uh, it's, uh, it happened over the last five years mainly that several uh, cases, uh, the uh, certificates provided with uh, the reference test samples uh, by certified bodies had to be revised based on the comments and outcomes from our laboratories. So they could really reach a very good standards. So now they are challenging the certified reference samples providers. So this is all regarding the particulate part of quality assurance through laboratories. What about the noble gas? Uh, this part is still a uh, uh, work in progress uh, because uh, we are still in this uh, phase three of the INGA, which also uh, includes uh, the uh, reanalysis of uh, noble gas samples at stations. There is a, a QQC program uh, which is being developed also for uh, uh, the noble gas. But uh, uh, there is still an open discussion on what will be the exact role of the laboratories uh, uh, for the noble gas uh, remeasurement. Mainly it is based uh, on considerations uh, which come from the uh, short uh, half-life of the xenon isotopes uh, uh, compared to the uh, half-lives uh, uh, of the CTBT relevant nuclides uh, for particulate. So I, I will not really go into uh, this uh, detail. Uh, one of the major uh, challenges for the noble gas uh, QQC uh, remeasurement uh, uh, program uh, is also the transport time for samples, because in this uh, case, the transport time is really playing uh, a major role. And up to now, we uh, have uh, three certified uh, laboratories for a uh, noble gas measurement. And they are uh, mainly measuring uh, sa uh, sample coming from Spalax uh, and Sauna uh, certified systems. Also in terms uh, of uh, reference standards, uh, we are still work in progress because uh, in fact we have uh, two laboratories uh, who can uh, as of today provide uh, reference samples. But the problem is uh, that still uh, uh, we cannot really uh, consider these uh, standards as traceable to international primary standards because we need to combine uh, radioactive uh, uh, component of xenon to the stable xenon measurement, which also has to be accurately uh, determined uh, in uh, uh, following uh, primary standards. And this is still uh, a challenge which is a work in progress uh, uh, from uh, all sides, uh, from uh, reference uh, standards provider from PTS and uh, from the laboratories. So this is everything from my side. Thank you for your attention. We are open to any questions. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Estelita from Indonesia. Uh, Besides the 
we know that when the there is a release the noble gases or radioisotop gases in, into the air that we have like a few hours before it's decay into the half-life like for example the xenon is for only 9 to 11 hour and then we have the radioactive background and then for uh, how do you choose the source site of the radio setup source the, the radio setup release because what kind of characteristic or things that you can uh, you can consider as the source of it because when for example the station get detect the noble gases it can be from anywhere for example from the because the wind blows it and then something like that what kind of uh, specification or requirement that you need to pick this is the source of this radio uh, the radio sort of gases something like that thank you thank you for your question i think a similar question uh, which was posed yesterday which uh, we expected somehow to 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 address the in this very session so um it is not like in the waveform where uh, it's very easy to triangulate and find the source location so the retinoclide station needs a big help from the atmospheric transport which uh, is uh, going back in time and uh, look from from where the air may come from but uh, as you go back in time the air may come from everywhere or at least from half of the globe. So how do we go back in time? And the possibility and importance to detect two nuclides, not just one nuclide, is, uh, uh, is very high because uh, this contains a time information from the source, which becomes even more complicated if you have more source time contributing to this uh, very location. If you look in Europe, you have a lot of uh, contribution from reactors, from uh, radiopharmaceutical source, and so on. So the sensitivity of uh, the station more and more in time, and I, I was saying that uh, time resolution is very important, uh, may, uh, is playing a big role to, f to fish for more than one nuclide. And also the uh, um, knowledge of the background around the station so uh, what is available in the, as a source uh, term in, in the globe and uh, constantly refresh this source and this information may help us to distinguish with the, if the signal comes from a real explosion or not. In a case of a strong waveform signature like in the DPRK, we know from where the source term may come. So it is uh, easier to play in a fusion between technology and to say, okay, my scenario that is coming from that. And then we can actually filter out the signature. This doesn't look like coming from that source through ATM and through the knowledge of the background. But uh, the importance to have more than one nuclide detecting the station is very high for uh, dis the discriminate this kind of, uh, of scenarios. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the noble gas systems, and it's a bit in two parts. It basically would be, if are there, and if so, what, what, what would the commercial and non-verification purposes of the development of noble gas systems be? As I was saying, the noble gas system technology, as it is today, it's been really tailor-made for the PTS. So I don't see commercial uh, uh, reasons to have it besides safety and, of course, security. I mean, uh, of course, uh, national nations can use it for uh, monitoring the reactor accident, for instance, or other things. But commercial use of the noble gas, I don't really see. I see really more on uh, uh, national concern or international, in case of the PTS, to, to monitor uh, uh, disaster or uh, treaty for treaty verification. Correct. And this is actually is posing a problem for us because we cannot acquire a system out of the shelf like in the particulate world. 
So we really have to rely on the few vendors that are uh, creating this ad hoc system. So this is actually a challenge for us and high cost. Thank you very much. Uh, have you envisaged any kind of chain of custody for those samples uh, uh, that the ISP kept? Thank you. Custody for what? Uh, can you repeat the question? Chain of custody for what? Yeah. As far as I know, the chain of custody so far is for those uh, samples that has been splitted for the half that is in the hands and controls of IT. My question is regarding the second half, which is in the uh, hands and control of the ISP. Uh, do you have any kind of chain of custody for that? Thank you. So, so the chain of custody is done for every samples, not just for a, a sample that special samples. And those are maintained also all the time for the two halves that are split. And uh, those uh, two halves are representing the original filter having the same serial code, half one and half two. So they are representing all the way to the lab the information that comes from the station all the time. If this was your question. Yes. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question based on something you brought up uh, in this Q&A session earlier. Um, you talked about how um, it's possible that some radionuclide signature may be um, from the generation of some um, either research reactor or radioisotope production reactor. So my question is, how do you account for that in the radionuclide monitoring system? Um, are you in communication with those facilities asking about their production or their operation? Or uh, is there some other way to account for that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, especially IDC, uh, it's working a lot uh, uh, on acquiring uh, from literature, but also for direct communication, the, uh, the typical release. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to have a, a uh, a point information, so a point in time information of the release. So maybe they, we will have a sort of annual average release. This helps, maybe, but not so much. What, the, what are we doing? Maybe we, uh, having a conservative scenario, okay, this release is, uh, uh, we can consider the upper limit that everything is released in one day or in, 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 in that time. But it's difficult to um, have a, a on the fly, they, they are not providing on the fly release information. There are projects in that, in that direction. There are projects in uh, looking at stack monitoring, so in order to have a sort of independent monitoring of, uh, of what has been released by the station, but uh, we are really in a very early stage. And also, this help us more in understanding what is the release process, but are not part of uh, the technology that should be used in the in the in the in the treaty. So it is a, a big area, a big topic of challenge for us to understand. And there is a lot of uh, um, is a is a specific project with IDC is running, which is called background campaigns, which also include the source term uh, understanding. But IDC, which is represented here, may come to that later on. I think. I think yeah. There is, there is probably a, a session on this. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Steven Herzog from the United States. And uh, my question is, is in addition to uh, products from reactors, what is the current state of efforts to um, differentiate or keep track of background signatures from uh, uh, medical isotope releases and to discriminate those uh, against uh, relevant products from nuclear explosions. Thank you very much. The second source that you mentioned is the one that actually is more uh, challenging for us because it represents a prompt fission, so a very fresh fission, and uh, in uh, 
few cases, or actually more and more, also the quantity that are released may represent uh, uh, a, a nuclear explosion quantity. And there is uh, not so much that we can do on that. Of course, we can uh, uh, bring to the attention of this uh, of these uh, countries or to the facility, but we have no leverage in saying, okay, please reduce that. Uh, and this is not our mandate. Of course, uh, uh, background campaign will help us to understand, also to fine-tune our ATM modeling, which is also used for discriminating this source. And, uh, and also, this, as I was saying, the stack monitoring is actually uh, one possibility uh, which is mainly for this kind of facility than reactors. Reactors are not so painful for us. Of course, uh, if you increase the sensitivity of the system, you may try to resolve uh, more and more from the time information uh, in the ATM, uh, this, uh, this source there. Okay, I think we're going to have to shortly, uh, so maybe one more question and then we'll, we'll have to wrap it up. Thanks. It's not actually a question. It's like, uh, is there any possibility that you might give us the open source of the data of the current status of the radioisotope in the air right now, like radionuclides, like how dangerous it, like the current data, like maybe in your website or something. I don't understand. So you, you're asking if we can release uh, the information about our detections? No, the, about the, it's like how dangerous is it right now, the radionuclides energy and then how how have they decayed so much, like from 1950 to right now, how dangerous it is, and then the current status of the level of the energy of the radionuclides, maybe, since, you, I don't know if I'm addressing this wrong, but since you did, maybe you, because you have uh, all the monitoring system, maybe that you can provide the data, maybe for educational purpose or something, because I'm looking for it. So our, our system are tuned to a very, very low, uh, level of sensitivity. So we are uh, looking at much, much lower than the safety limits. So uh, what we are monitoring is uh, very far from uh, uh, what can happen. What what happened in Fukushima? In fact, uh, Fukushima somehow saturated our uh, our systems. And in even Fukushima itself, uh, uh, traveling all over Europe, uh, reaching Europe, they were already at the limit which is, were below safety limit. So we are not assessing the safety of the radionuclide which are around us. Actually, we are going much lower than that. So this is not our mandate for doing that. What we do is to release products which are containing um, what we have found in terms of concentration, and these are shared to all the member states in real time. In real time, uh, the raw data which are coming, and after the review is done, also the report uh, from the analyst uh, and what has been found. Of course, then you can uh, uh, benchmark this data against the limits for the, which every country is. Also, that one is different. But uh, as I say, we are not. When I talk about so many nuclides that we are detecting, don't be don't be worried. This is much lower than the safety limit that uh, that you are of concern. Yeah. Okay. She's okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, show our appreciation for the panel. Uh, Thanks to Barbara, Romano, and uh, uh, Jim for, for that. Uh, we're going to continue with the IMS uh, session more or less immediately, uh, carrying on into uh, looking again at radionuclides, uh, but this time data processing and analysis side of things. Uh, so as we ask our colleagues uh, to take the stage for that, I just want to ask you, the audience, to help me out with something. Um, you know the app that we have. There is a functionality on it for voting that we intend to use in the coming days, but we just need to test it very quickly. So what I'm going to do is we're going to put up on the screen a dummy question. I'd ask you all to switch on your app, please. And uh, we'll put up the question for about 30 seconds or so. We'll ask you to answer it. Anyone who's following online as well, please switch on your app. 
and uh, and uh, also answer that as well. Hope you can see the uh, question. It's a uh, it's a pretty straightforward one. How are you participating in the symposium? A in person, B online, or C somehow uh, not participating. <laughs> so. Uh, Excuse me? T test round or yeah, we're just testing it to see if it works. Okay, have you seen the question? Uh, sorry, Cormac, I think we've seen the question, but it's not clear where in the app we can vote. Just a moment. Well, this is the very reason we're trying it out, because we don't know either. We haven't used this functionality before. So just bear with me one moment. I see that some people have been able to respond, so uh, maybe those who were able to can tell us where they were able to. It's on that. test round. OK. You may have to refresh. You may have to refresh, somebody says. I can explain it if you want. Um, if you go in the app on the way bottom, it says refresh event data. And if yeah. you hit that and then scroll back to the top, it's under the it's test, under round, test question. round. Yeah, I've, I've just done the same thing. I, uh, in fact, in my case, I restarted the app. And it's the first item that you will see under the banner image of the symposium. So that's where you can uh, vote. You should uh, see the questions coming up. And then you're asked to please confirm, are you sure you want to vote for this question? And then you can vote. So I think we can uh, close the voting now. We've uh, figured out how that works. So now let me uh, introduce our next two colleagues, Jonathan uh, Baer and Ari Pekka uh, Lepainen, who are going to continue with the session. Thank you very much. OK, good morning on my behalf. Um, I'm Ari Leppanen, and uh, I work here at the IDC uh, as an an analyst. Uh, like my colleague here on the left, Jonathan, is also an analyst. So we're going to talk about uh, radionuclide and noble gas data processing and analysis. Um, <clears throat> first, I have to apologize that uh, watching the previous presentation, I just noticed that we have uh, several overlapping slides and similar slides. but. Uh, this is uh, one unity, and it's difficult to separate one from the other, so we have to speak a little, little overlap on each other. So this is the CTPT or Radio Nuclide Monitoring Network. And um, the design elements of the Radio Nuclide are stated below. And these are mainly comes, comes from, the, from the treaty. Uh, the 14 days mentioned here is uh, quite a challenge due to the atmospheric conditions and due to venting. Um, the monitoring system covers 80 stations for particulate radionuclides and also 40 are with the noble gas capability. Right now we have uh, 70 stations, particulate stations working. And uh, noble gas are 25 and 25 stations with noble gas certified. And that's the locations of the stations. And uh, the main message here is that they, they are all over. They are at sea, at land, middle of the continents, coastal stations, high altitude stations pretty much everywhere. And also on the left side, there's um, mentioned technologies. The manual stations, which uh, was so shown in the previous presentation. Also the automated, automated stations, RASA and ARAME. And then the uh, noble gas stations, PALAX, SAUNA and ARIX. Uh, the fact that the stations are inland and at sea, at coastal high altitude, they 
they also present different qualities as, from a spectral viewing point. So more or less all the spectra are different. They have a different concentrations of uh, iso natural isotopes. And this is a, a challenge from a data processing and uh, viewing point of view. So this is a small uh, recap of the uh, nuclear event. Uh, nuclear reaction results in fission products from fissile material and also the activation product from a sur surrounding material. And <clears throat> uh, most fission and activation products condense and attach to aerosols and they are called, called particulates. And the noble gases, which are chemically inherent, they don't react with anything, like xenon uh, is a very good indication of nuclear explosion too. In underground ex nuclear explosion, the particulates are retained inside the rock, provided that uh, there's no cracks in the bedrock which uh, allow the venting of the test. And, uh, but the noble gas are more, like, more likely to escape the rock. Um, so the atmospheric transportation from, uh, takes from zero to 14 days. However, it should be noted that if you take Fukushima accident, uh, it took uh, roughly two weeks, 14 days for the plume to travel from Japan, go around the world to come back to Japan. And this is uh, very challenging for the atmospheric transport modeling, which will be the topic of the next presentation. But, okay, the, the, from the IMS station, the particulates and noble gases, as stated in the previous uh, presentation, we have 24 hour collection for particulates, uh, 12 or 24 hours for noble gases, depending on the technology. Then we have a 24 hour decay. Um, the decay is because um, in uh, typical outside air, the radon is uh, of the order of some becquerels per, micro, uh, per cubic meter. And the, the CTPTL requirement for barium 140 has to be below 30 micro becquerels. So that's 100,000 times below the radon concentration in typically in the outside air. And that's why the, we, have a, we have to let the filter to decay for a while before we can measure it. And then noble gas is uh, about roughly seven hour processing. Uh, then data acquisition, 24 hours. And for noble gas is 24 or 12 hours, depending on the technology. And then the data is sent to here into this building via the global communication infrastructure. So all in all, uh, the delay, considering the, uh, the analysis side, is at least two days to minimum. And that is uh, due to the processing at the station. So if you compare the radionuclide and uh, SHI, the SHI stands for uh, seismic hydroacoustic infrasound, the waveform technology. Uh, they give you the prompt, prompt response, whereas the radionuclide is delayed. Um, the radionuclide has only few events, whereas the SHI has many events. As stated by, by the previous speaker, the radionuclide is a poor lo location ability, whereas the SHI has an excellent location ability. However, the reason why we do radionuclide is that the actual indication of nuclear fissions, fission 
is the fission products. Without the fission products, uh, we cannot clearly say that there hasn't been a fission. So the primary role of the radionuclide monitoring is to provide unambiguous evidence of a nuclear explosion through the detection and the identification of fission products. Okay. So the, <clears throat> you, have, you heard the term particulates. Uh, so what are the particulates? Uh, on the left-hand corner here, you can see the very good source of particulate aerosols. The volcano uh, eruption, you spew out uh, uh, sodium, uh, sorry, SO4 molecules, um, and also dust, and different kind of uh, um, chemicals which tend to form aerosols. Aerosols are typically sites from micrometer and upwards, sometimes below, depending on the phase of the aerosol. And the radioactive isotopes stick to these aerosols, and more or less the fate of the ra radioactive aerosols, the radioactive uh, isotopes become the fate of the aerosol itself. And the aerosols serve as a carriers for these uh, radioactive isotopes. Okay, this is the slide what you saw before. Um, this is the aerosol cloud, it sticks to the filter. Uh, decay measurement, then this is all happening at the station. Now, what we are interested in is what is happening in this building right here, which is the IDC building and the CTBTO, the E building. At, the, at Vienna. Okay, this is um, what you saw before, and also the measurement phase, measured at the station. Uh, this is just to show the equipment. So this is the American-built uh, RASA system, and roughly if I would stand here, my, this would be about my height. So this weights several hundreds of kilos. And it's not very portable. Um, <clears throat> this is the process flowchart inside the IDC. So the data comes through the, from the station to International Data Center, which is located here. Uh, first, um, it, depending on what the state signatories uh, want, they can get the raw data directly from IDC sent to the data centers, which is this SPHD sample pulse height data. I have to apologize, apologize all the abbreviations, but uh, it uh, gets a little messy. However, <clears throat> the, when the data arrives to the international data center, it's processed and it gets distri distributed. Also, at the same time, uh, this ATM, that's the atmospheric transport model, but that is the topic of the next talk, so I don't go too much into it. But um, <clears throat> our process pipeline goes so that first it's automated processing, and it creates this uh, ARR, which is the automated radionuclide report. This gets sent to the member uh, state signatories immediately, right after processing. Um, after that, this uh, lands on uh, for interactive review for an analyst, which is Jonathan and I, and some other colleagues too. We do the interactive review, mainly look at the automatic processing has done everything correctly, remove necessary uh, misidentifications or maybe add something if, if needed, um, but all is kept track of. And then it, Excuse me. Then it goes into the categorization. Noble gas is categorized as ABC. Jonathan will tell you more about that later. And particulates, here P, is categorized as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
And once this categorization is done <coughs> the <coughs> and confirmed, this uh, creates this RRR, which is the re reviewed radionuclide report. And that goes to the Na National Data Center. <coughs> Um, we have 83 CTPT relevant nuclides, uh, which is listed here, and this is the categorization uh, flowchart, which was shown in a previous presentation also. Uh, basically, it goes to see if we have a spectrum. Does it contain uh, man-made nuclides or not? If no, it, then it asks, is it typical or not? Yes or no? If it's typical, then it's level one, uh, non-typical level two. If, it's, uh, if, if it contains uh, man-made nuclides, it, it, uh, it asks, is it typical or not? If yes, then it's level three. If no, is it fission product or one or two fission products? Then it goes, if it's one fission product, then it goes to anomalous anthropogenic, that is level four and uh, multiple anthropogenic fission products since level five. Um, and level five samples, multiple anthropogenic uh, sample contains, uh, this is the nucleus on the CTPT relevant particulate radionuclides at analepsy high concentration. So this is, a, once again, the more clearly presented the categorization. Typical background, uh, normal background in the nature, and nothing new. However, I should stress the fact that uh, depending on the station location, this typical background may be different. So typical background in one station is not typical background in another station. So they vary from station to station. Anomalous background, typically this is where you can have uh, uh, extreme weather systems, uh, drought or high pressures, you may get anomalous background from natural nuclides. Typical anthropogenic is level three. Uh, as mentioned previously, in Europe, this is a Chernobyl accident, is, a very, is a, one of these important level three contributors. Um, in Chernobyl accident, the CZ-137 was released throughout the Europe. And uh, every now and then you see uh, CZ-137 in the environmental samples. And you have been seeing that for the last 32 years. And also um, <clears throat> in level three, there's a sodium-24, it's a CTPT relevant isotope. However, this is also a natural isotope. So level three can be, um, in a, so sodium-22 is produced in, uh, in, in, uh, in the natural processes and it's also produced in, in man-made isotopes. So level three can be also from natural sources in some cases. Uh, level four is animals anthropogenic, so man-made, and uh, level five is the multiple. So this is the types of what we see. Uh, as mentioned before, the radon is uh, important or very abundant in atmosphere. So then terrestrial radionuclides, uh, in, other, in other words, this is uh, dust coming from the Earth. And then we have these uh, cosmogenic isotopes, which are formed and produced in the upper at atmosphere, and they get transported to the ground level. Then we have uh, uh, anthropogenic radionuclides, um, CTPT non-relevant nuclides. A lot of these are radiopharmaceutical isotopes, and they are produced and um, released in the atmosphere or environment every now and then. And then you have the 83 CTPT relevant radionuclides. Um, this is our tool. Uh, this is uh, certified by the member states. It's a uh, MATLAB based. 
It's called SAINT-2, uh, Simulation Assisted Interactive Nuclide Review Tool. And um, this SAINT-2, the, 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 after the automatic processing, the spectrum is, is shown here in the SAINT-2, and uh, this is when we start processing and analyzing uh, the spectrum. This is a quite typical spectrum what we see. Uh, I hope you can see the peaks are here in the blue. So our job is to identify all the peaks and uh, from the in collection information the actual concentration in air is calculated. So this is just to show the every station is different. The previous was uh, was from um, from from Japan, and this particular spectrum is from Antarctica. And in Antarctica, there's a large ice sheet, and there's not much radon or dust flowing in the air, so th this is very clean compared to the previous one. Um, so, the requirements before station can be accepted to operation on. IDC requires that detector, which is um, more or less the top detector and uh, all the technical details, had to certain, fulfill certain quality uh, requirements. It has to be calibrated with known source isotopes, and then it has to be also validated by the IDC, the calibration. And then it must fulfill certain quality control requirements and then we, we need the blank. Uh, we did some software improvements a uh, year and a half back, and uh, now the blank has a, quite an important role. The blank is actually an empty filter which is measured at the station, 72 hours, uh, three times the normal acquisition time. And since we are interested in what is flowing in the air, what is the category, what is the we are sampling air. We're not interested so much in uh, how the dirty the chamber is or the, what does the detector see, cos cosmic uh, rays or not. So by using this blank, we can actually get to the what is in the air, not just in the background in general. And this is easier to distinguish any abnormalities from the, in the filter. And that's more or less the blank spectrum. Okay, um, this is the, just to show and demonstrate to you that the stations are here on the left. This is uh, half of the data, and, and this is the, uh, half of the station, excuse me. And this is the timeline. So the vertical are stations, and, um, and the horizontal is time. So this is, represents one spectrum, and more or less you can view here what is going on throughout the network reviewed spectrum or not, and what is the each category of the each spectrum. And in, in this, this is the noble gas. This shows also the noble gas. This is the sound of noble gas, 12-hour sampling. It produces a pattern like this. But this gives you an overview, overview of what is happening at the stations and what, what are the categories. And also the trending. Um, depending on um, uh, when you analyze something, you know, like uh, Romano in the previous talk talked about concentrations. Uh, this is that gives you the concentration trends. If you see something, big dips here or big jumps here, it makes you question whether their data is reliable or not. But this is a quite typical behavior of the uh, atmospheric uh, radon daughters and also the beryllium-7 isotopes. Um, and where it all com comes to, this is the IDC final product to the state signatories. Uh, that's the ra reviewed radionuclide report front page. I think this is uh, another four page comes after this, but. Uh, this gets sent, sent. This this gets sent to the uh, state signatories along with the 
atmospheric transport model so they can view what was seen and where did they come from. And now, now I give the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Ari. Okay. Um, I'm going back to this uh, processing pipeline uh, with some specificities for noble gas. Roughly, the processing pipeline is the same or is very similar for particulates and for noble gas. I will try to emphasize some uh, details when, when, or well, some differences when necessary. So, all the spectra uh, measured at the station are sent as data files in the IDC and then are directly provided to uh, national data centers or to state signatories. Here in the IDC, at this stage, uh, data are received and then directly processed in our database uh, where they are merged directly with ATM information and a first uh, report called automatic uh, radionuclide report is produced and uh, sent to national data center again. After this, uh, proce this first processing, Every spectrum is analyzed interactively at the IDC by a team of analysts. And after this interactive review, uh, the categorization is given uh, to, to every spectrum. The categorization for particulates goes from one to five. Big difference for noble gases, uh, the categories are level A, level B, and then uh, level C. When this part of the work is done, a reviewed report is created and again, uh, forwarded to national data center and uh, state signatories. So this is uh, the global processing of a single spectrum or a single measurement from the IMS station to uh, the state signatories. Three different technologies are operated in the system, uh, as already mentioned by my colleagues Romano and, uh, and Barbara in a previous presentation. I'm just giving uh, some pictures for your information. So this is, oh, sorry. This is a, a Spalax system. We have the sauna system and then we have the ARIC system. And this is the typical spectrum we get for a Spalax. And this kind of information is a typical spectrum that we get for beta gamma coincidence, I mean for sauna and for uh, ARIC's uh, system. As I already mentioned previously, all spectra received for the IMS station are automatically processed in the IDC database where a first pass analysis uh, is done, is performed, and then used as a basis for the interactive review by the analyst. The interactive review is done for every spectrum using two different dedicated softwares depending on the technology. We have uh, the so-called uh, SYN2 software, which is used for particulate, as, as you already seen in uh, Ari's part of the presentation. We have specific tools that I will just illustrate a bit uh, later. And we have uh, NORFI for beta gamma coincidence measurement spectrum, then for analyzing uh, SANA and ARIX uh, measurements. These two software are routinely used uh, in the IDC. We have different uh, kind of helping tools to make proper decision uh, if needed, but these two softwares are the, the, the most used and the most, uh, well, the certified softwares that we are using. This is the typical spectrum that we, as an analyst, uh, are receiving. I'm, of course, not going to enter into the details of the analysis, uh, and I think that you will have a demonstration early next week on that, on that topic. I just want to illustrate two or three points in this. Um, roughly, we have all the SOH data. My colleague Romano was uh, speaking about this state of health data. We, as an analyst, have a quick view or can have a quick view of the state of health data. Do they correspond to uh, the, the, the standard operating uh, conditions or not? This is a kind of a flagging system. We then have the beta gamma coincidence spectrum and it's kind of discrimination in a gamma spectrum and a beta spectrum. This is uh, the sample measurements. We have information here about the detection. You can see, I don't know if it's really clear on the presentation, but you have uh, red numbers and uh, black numbers. Red numbers means that we have something in the spectrum, so something is detected is detected. In this case, we have two different radio, radio isotopes that are detected, detected sorry, uh, xenon 131M and xenon 133. And we have uh, some uh, sampling and acquisition information. What is maybe, what I would like to, to show you in this spectrum is that uh, this spectrum is not correctly calibrated. Uh, and this can be, sorry, 
Okay? This can be seen because there is a shift between this kind of boxes that we call regions of interest and the spectrum. Um, again, I don't know if it's really clear on, on, on this slide, but uh, boxes and detection, so this uh, accumulation of, of dots does not correspond very well. The role of the analyst in this specific situation is to calibrate the spectrum. For the calibration, we are using what we call a QC spectrum. QC stands for quality control measurements, which looks like this where we can have or where we have reference peak uh, for the gamma calibration and reference peak for the beta calibration we first calibrate the gamma side using this spectrum fixing then this axis and when this is done we can use this specific shape linked to specific physical processes to calibrate uh, the the beta uh, spectrum or the beta part of the spectrum when this is done uh, the spectrum is then correctly calibrated is reviewed by analysts and in this case we can see that uh, region of interest and the spectrum uh, matches better than in the previous case. We can also notice that instead of having two radiocinone isotopes detected we now have three because of the correct calibration of the spectrum. I will stop here for the analysis of this. Again you will have a demonstration where we will be, we will be happy to answer many uh, other more technical questions. As an illustration of a difference between the SYN2 software that we are using for uh, the Thenon review and the one used for particulate, we basically have a different or an additional tool which is called Thenon review, uh, which directly focuses on radio xenon uh, isotope of interest. We then have uh, on this figure five uh, region of interest that we are uh, looking for when there is a zoom. Um, namely, xenon 131M, 133M, xenon 133 and 135, and then we have uh, in the region of X-rays at very low energy. Big differences in the spectrum. We have uh, blue uh, background and black background. Obviously, the black background, black background is when something is detected. We, cl we clearly see here one peak which corresponds to a detection of xenon 131M, and in this case, we have a clear detection of xenon-133. Nothing is detected for xenon-135 and 133M on, based on this figure and supposing or assuming that the calibration was perfectly done. We then can say that we have two isotopes present in this spectrum, namely xenon-131 and, and 133. I will come back to this uh, processing pipeline and I will now focus on this uh, part, which is the categorization, because I think that this is quite important for, for you uh, to, to understand very correctly. This categorization same is very similar to what, uh, what is done for uh, particulates. Small differences here is that we don't have five different levels. We only have three levels, which are level A, level B, and level C. So we have a kind of three-level activity concentration categorization scheme. Level A is then when no radiocinone is present in the spectrum. The spectrum is then clean. Nothing is uh, detected. Level B is then xenon is detected but within the typical range of the station. The question now is what does this mean, typical? And this uh, typical range is defined based on the long-term trends that may uh, take into account up uh, of 365 moving days to calculate a kind of threshold to discriminate between what is a level B then typical for the station and what is a level C, meaning that something is detect detected above this threshold, making it uh, anomalous xenon uh, detection. This is uh, explained or summarized here. So coming, well, we have the spectrum analysis. The first question is, is xenon present, present or not in the spectrum? If the answer is no, then we have a level A, it's a clean spectrum. If yes, then the question is, is this uh, xenon level typical or not? If the answer is yes, then it's a level B typical for the station. If the answer is no, uh, the, the, the radio xenon level is higher than what can be expected at this station, then we have a level C anomalous uh, for the station. To illustrate, this is a different angle of the same explanation. So for this example, we have here selected one station, which is uh, RN63 uh, Stockholm, Sweden. 
and we have represented six years of uh, yes six years of uh, data on this timeline. The idea is, here is just to explain what is the difference between what is a level A, level B, and a level C. We can see here that we have the LC. LC is what we call the critical limit, and this critical limit is used to determine whether or not radio xenon is present in the spectrum. If there is nothing, so if the measurement is below this LC criterion, then we have a level A spectrum. Above this uh, LC criterion, we have a level B because it's typical because the, the activity concentration is typical for the station. And then we have another threshold which is based on uh, the interquartile range. It's the median uh, calculated over 365 days plus three times the interquartile range for the station. This helps us to discriminate between what is typical from the station in which case we, sorry, can you go back? Yeah, thanks. So in this case, we can uh, discriminate between a level B, which are all represented here in yellow. We then have this threshold uh, calculated on this, uh, it's kind of moving moving uh, average. And then level C, if an, a detection is above this uh, threshold. So this explains, in, with another point of view, uh, this categorization in level A, B, and uh, C. Just to give you an overall picture of the noble gas categorization uh, results, we have here studied all the stations that are in operation since 2012 for a time period of about six years, so from 1st of September 2012 up to yesterday. The coverage is all 25 IMS noble gas systems that are currently in operation, so certified, and the total number of spectra is about 60, 60 it's a bit more than 69,000. We can see on this uh, graph that about 50% of the spectra were categorized as level A, meaning nothing was uh, detected in the spectrum. About 42% were uh, categorized as level B, meaning that uh, xenon was detected, but in the typical range of the station. And 4% of the spectra were categorized as uh, level C. We can see here two gray uh, parts, 1 and 3%, that are spectra that have not been categorized or marked as bad. Uh, let's say that these spectra are not, uh, either not really good from the analyst point of view, so cannot be uh, categorized or are marked bad because of some uh, issue. In total, 10 xenon isotopes were detected in about 46% of the spectra, taking into account level B and uh, level C. And last slide, exactly the same data set, except that in this case we are representing the levels, excuse me, the levels by station. So we here or we here or have, excuse me, all the stations that we have and the number of spectra. And just, uh, well, let's select, uh, this is FX29, French station, this is Spalak station. We can see that we have uh, almost, well, a big part of the, the data set collected at this station was categorized as a level A, and we only have a uh, few spectra, 54 to be exactly, that were categorized as a level C. This is, uh, let's say, a station where we have very few uh, detections of radio xenon. Let's take another station uh, like EUX04, Australia, where we have a quite uh, good, uh, how can I say that, uh, where we have almost uh, the same number of level A and level B, and then up on top we can see about 360 spectra categorized as uh, level C. So again, different view of this categorization, and I think that this is uh, quite important for you to understand the difference between these different categories. As a summary now, um, currently IDC receives a bit more than 100 spectra a day. All these spectra are processed and categorized automatically, and first reports are created uh, for state signatories, these are called ARR, automatic radionuclide reports. Every spectrum 
that is uh, sent to the IDC is interactively reviewed by a team of analysts and final data products are generated, including then final category and provided again to state signatories for further uh, analysis, investigation or decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Nji Kim from South Korea. I have two quick questions about the particulate categorization. First one is that, um, could you please expa explain more about the differences between the level four and level five particulates in terms of nuclear tests? And the second question is that, is the categorization, is this, is this sample categorization international standard or CTBT specific? Thank you. Um, I answered the second question first. Uh, to my understanding, this categorization is CTBT specific. And the first question is um, uh, the level four difference between level four and five in terms of nuclear explosion, right? Um, in nuclear explosions, um, you create uh, several isotopes, not just one. And seeing one isotope uh, for in a particular spectrum is, is not very convincing evidence for a nuclear explosion itself. You would expect to see also something else. However, uh, seeing just one, it doesn't mean that nothing happened. It just means that we have to have to look more carefully and 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 uh, analyze uh, spectrum more carefully. Uh, in your, uh, I don't have your number of slide. But it's, I think it's more in the beginning. And uh, you said uh, that the slide is uh, entitled Comparison of Monitoring Techniques. And you said the primary role of radionuclide monitoring is to provide an ambiguous evidence of a nuclear explosion through the detection and identification of uh, fission products. And in the um, previous presentation of the last two days, I understand the nuclear explosion can be fission and fusion. And so my question is, uh, do the different radioactive particles provide useful information on the type of the nuclear test, such as fusion and uh, fission in your, <laughs> in your detection? Okay, um, I have to say that I'm not a nuclear weapons expert. Mm -hmm. But uh, to my understanding, um, there is a difference. But I, like I said, I don't. The the fusion bomb is uh, detonated, or the, how to create the fusion? You need a fission first, fission bomb. So there's no clear, a pure fusion bomb. So and a fission bomb is is fission then. So you need. Um, how should I put it? So the classic classical fish, fissile material fission produces a uh, number of isotopes. I think it's about 2,000 isotopes right at the, after the fission. Um, and this, this is uh, an infusion bomb. You need the fission to start the fusion reaction. So you have in, in both types of bombs, you have both, both, both uh, fissions, so you, need, you produce fission isotopes in, in both types of bombs. But um, the role of the CTBTO is not to distinguish what was exploded. We provide data, what we see.
Thank you very much uh, to both our discussants today, uh, to Jonathan and to Ari Pekka. Uh, please join me in uh, showing your appreciation for what I think was a very interesting session. And now we're going to have a half hour break. Tea and coffee, as ever, is available outside. Two things I want to remind you of uh, before you go. We're going to take down the sign-up sheets for the Atom Institute, so I'm going to stop reminding you of this after, <laughs> after this point. Uh, so last chance to, to put a cross against your name. And just a reminder for everybody of the technical keynote that's going to take place in this room at 1.30 p.m. with Professor Paul Richards on the topic of verifying a nuclear test ban, a historical perspective, and we encourage all of you uh, to kindly attend the technical keynote session. Thank you.
several times this morning about the ATM, uh, and now we will see more in details uh, why we need ATMs. We know that, oh, by the way, my name is Pierre Roy, Cyan, is too much, uh, okay. Uh, atmospheric science officer. Uh, I did that work with uh, Yananta and uh, Noyoki from uh, IDC also. So we have this uh, wonderful uh, monitoring system uh, developed to, mon to detect any type of nuclear explosion. And to, to do this, we we use a lot of SHI, seismic hydroacoustic and ultrasound data. And those, uh, those systems are very powerful because they can be coupled to advanced triangulation techniques. So it is possible to pinpoint uh, the origin of, of any of those events. And you saw an example with uh, DPRK where where the ellipse is relatively small. So, so we, we have a high confidence in the, in the location. Uh, on the contrary, maybe, our radionuclide detection are more difficult to pinpoint. The origin of those emissions is much more difficult. It is, uh, it is not possible to use triangulation uh, in that sense, and the, those also, those particles, those gases, they, they are being uh, transported by the atmosphere, which is very complex. So we have to use uh, atmospheric transport modeling to try to identify the path, the backward path to the origin for, for those detections. So that's, that's the role of ATM. So, and we will we'll see it in more details now. So, so uh, let's say this is your sampling site. You, you will see that it is a very sophisticated animation here. And so what goes into the, the sampling uh, done at this station? If you look, let's say 24 hours in the past, there will be air from different directions, from different origins. So the air that we breathe now in this room, some of it was in Switzerland uh, uh, two days ago, some was in Germany three days ago, and some were in France five days ago, or ten days ago it was in Africa. So it is the difficulty related to ATN. The air that we that uh, that we sample comes from different location at different time. So, and if you go back in time, let's say 48 hours ago, then the area spread, and if you go back again, then it is even bigger. And at one point, of course, if you wait long enough, let's say two weeks, uh, the air could come from any direction, from any location on the globe. So, so that's, that's quite a challenge. So this, uh, this represents the uncertainty on, not the uncertainty, but the possible location associated to a 24 hour sampling. It is not uncertainty, it is the fact that air comes from different, has different origin. And, and of course, if you go back in time, this area uh, becomes larger. So there is the transport aspect, but there is more than that. Of course, uh, there is all kind of different mechanism. Let's, let's say there is a precipitation. So a precipitation will capture most of your particles. and, and put them to the ground, so removing them from the atmosphere. So this is where the position, there is also dry deposition, the particles hitting the surface. Uh, that's dry deposition, they're all, they're, of course they are also a chemical transformation. So, so it, it is very complex, but usually for the 
in our business uh, at CTBTO, uh, the, the, the most important are the advection and dispersion. So it is related to uh, the wind fields. So it is not the wind fields as we we think of most of the time. It is, okay, it, this morning there is a nice southerly wind and temperature is uh, warm and pleasant. But if you, if you go away a little bit, then the wind will be from the southwest and further away it will be from, from the north, for example. And then if you wait a few hours, it will change in direction. So it is, it is very complex because you have to take into consideration the spatial and temporal variations of the winds. So it means that you, 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 have, you, have, you need to have analysis of the winds at different time and at different levels. So it, it becomes a kind of challenging. And this is done using uh, what is called numerical weather prediction. So in, in, in a few words, numerical weather prediction is just a set of physical equation that you try to solve using a large computer. And what is important to realize, it is what is called a initial uh, problem. Uh, it, it, so if you, if you know perfectly the current state of the atmosphere, you can forecast its future state, given that you have all the right equations. Okay, that's, that's the theory. And in fact, if, if you look at weather forecasts and WP forecasts over the last 20 years, there has been a, a tremendous in, increase in, in the accuracy of those uh, predictions. And part of it comes from better uh, computers, bigger computers, and better observing. So, of course, to, it, since, since it is a uh, initial problem, uh, initial condition problem, so you, you have to, to have this initial condition. So how, how to do this? We, we have all kinds of different observations. Uh, in the past, it was mainly surface observation. So station all, all over the world taking observation of temperature, uh, pressure, wind, uh, uh, and the precipitation, for example. So, so those were the, the main station, the main observation initially used in NWP. And also the same over the ocean with buoys and the soundings, so which is large weather balloon that you release in the atmosphere, they go up to uh, 40,000 uh, meter or something like this. And then we added aircraft, so while the aircraft takes off or, or lands, it, it measures the, the, usually the, the winds and temperature. So this is very interesting data, but the, the real uh, influx of data comes from satellite. So we have all kinds of satellite now, and you see uh, on this how it is covered. So it is estimated that in each, each time you want to initialize your NWP model, you have about 30 million pieces of information. Uh, it, it is not quite enough yet, but it is much better than it was uh, 20 years ago. And this is, again, this is the, the type. Uh, for example, for uh, synaptic, uh, surface synaptic and ships, so those are surface observation. Uh, about 68,000 pieces of information. And this includes, uh, this you have to multiply, each station will report uh, temperature, humidity, pressure, wind, wind direction, etc. So, 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 so this is a type of, of data that we, we use to, init to initialize uh, NWP. Okay, and uh, so we have kind of rough idea. We have this NWP models, which provides a very sophisticated 3D wind field evolving in time, so which really is a 4D wind field. Uh, imagine in your head, you, you have a balloon, you release that balloon, so it will go, it will go with the wind. 
of course, if it is much lighter, it will go up too. But l l let's say that this balloon is just at the same density as the atmosphere, and it will just follow uh, the wind. And of course, this wind will vary in time and in space. So just to illustrate this a little bit, uh, I propose a very uh, simple scenario. We, we have a ship in fire so somewhere in the in South Atlantic. Uh, the location is, is given there, and the time of this uh, burning is uh, uh, on the 15th of uh, January. And so and most of the pollutant is issued within the, the first 150 meter, which is typical for what we do usually for uh, radioactive material. Uh, we don't know what exactly what, what it is, so in that case we use what we call a tracer. So, so that's a very passive tracer. And the meteorological condition will be provided by the ECMWF. ECMWF stands for European Center for Medium uh, Weather Forecast. So, so it, is, uh, it is our provider here of uh, NWP products, so that's what CTBT uh, uses for ATM. Also, you saw yesterday for infrasound, they, they really need the, the, the weather conditions. So that's that's what we do. So so now we'll see this uh, ship in fire. So so you can see the initial. So the initial uh, ship is here. It's called ISL01, and you notice here that we have our. Uh, IMS station, uh, Tristan de Cuna. There are about, uh, I don't know, less than 100 people, uh, 1,000 1, people living on that island, but still, we, we are concerned about, will, will they be affected by, by this plume from the burning ship? So one way to, to, do, to, do, to decide to, or to, uh, to answer that question is to run our ATM. So I, I started this, uh, simulation using the data I just showed. So the winds will carry, you see that the wind carry uh, the, the plume, and at one point you also see that it does affect uh, Tristan and Kuna at that time too. So people there can be worried. <laughs> it is, of course, it is a simulated case, but in real life, that's how we apply ATM uh, uh, for emergency response. That's not really our business, but, but still, you can imagine. Uh, let's, let's say there is a detection uh, uh, at, at one place, and you wonder if it is uh, related to uh, nuclear testing. So what you can do is you can initiate a, a simulation like this, and you will see in advance, uh, one day, two days, three days, one week in advance, if your station will be affected, so so this helps deciding if you if you want to to pay a special attention to that station. So in that case, we would pay attention to to GBX 68 and X1 XE as uh, in South Africa and uh, and a few other. So forward modeling is interesting for for, for this and 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 I think this slide makes it clear that it really depends on the 3D wind fields and that this wind field varies quite a lot in time. So, uh, uh, but in that case, uh, we, knew, we knew that there was this fire, maybe it was reported by people on the ship, by the captain calling a station, but it's sometimes you detect something and you don't know, you don't have any prior information, you don't know where it comes from, uh, you don't know when it was released, you, you, you don't know what it is. So in that case, you can apply the same ATM. The only difference, you reverse wind direction. That's what we call backward modeling. So you see, that this is the same wind field as before, and, and you will notice that now the plume goes against the wind, because the winds are the real winds, but when doing your ATM, you reverse the winds. So you will see that the plume goes against the, 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 the mean, wind, mean, wind, mean, mean wind field. Sorry. And also what is interesting is, uh, again, this is your ship. 
So, so you see it, it's this point here. So it is, if, if you had no prior information, you could say, oh, it's possible that the plume comes from that shape. And that's, that's the way we use, that's the main usage of ATM here at CTBTO. We have some information and we, uh, using ATM we can confirm that the emission, the detection was related to a, a specific point. Okay? So the, the most common usage of ATM here at CTBT is uh, from what we call from the receptor location. So we have a detection, where is, where is it from? Where does it come from? So to answer that question, you run your ATM in backward mode, so it meaning that we reverse the wind direction. And what is interesting also is you, you have to realize, we, we explained this morning all the process, like for particulate, it takes uh, three days for, um, for a noble gas, at least two days. So by the time we have the observation available, we have all the analysis. So the ATM uh, is produced before we get the actual analysis. So the ATM is produced on a continuous basis for all stations all the time. So whenever there is a detection, the ATM is already available. And we'll see later the, 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 on, on the details. But it is important to realize that in backward mode, that is nice, it is always based on an analysis and it means that we can produce the guidance before we get the observation, the final observation. And uh, as I mentioned, in, in forward mode, it is also interesting uh, to predict where, again, you, you will work on a scenario uh, later uh, in, in the symposium. So maybe you, you have, maybe you, you will have this type of information there is a possibility for a release at one location. We produce a forward modeling, and then you know which stations should be affected. And also it is very powerful to validate different hypotheses. For example, you detect two isotopes of uh, xenon, and the ratio of them will give you an idea when they were produced. Let's say they were produced, you, you have a detection with Xenon 133 and 131M, and the ratio gives you five days. So you know this, this thing was produced five days. So using your ATM, you can look back five days, find different possible area, and then from, from that, you run forward in time, five days, and you, you, you can see if other stations should have been affected. So it is, it is very powerful also to uh, explore different hypotheses. What we use here at CTBT is a very sophisticated ATM model called FlexPart. We use a version 932. And as I mentioned, we, we use uh, weather data from the ECMWF and also from NSEP. So we have, in fact, two different sources of meteorological data. So it adds some redundancy and also we can compare. We can produce one run with NCEP, one run, run with ACMWF, so you, you have an idea how well they, they correlate. So this is an example of uh, at, uh, volcanic ash at, from Mount Etna and this, the associated uh, simulation. And this is interesting because with ash uh, plume or from burning uh, fire, uh, forest fire, etc., there is, you can see the plume, at least for a while. For radioactive cloud, it's not possible. There is, there is no remote detection of uh, radioactive cloud, and you cannot see them. Uh, and often they are very not often, always, very diffuse, except very close uh, to the, uh, the source. So very diffuse, but, but the good thing is that the RN stations are, are very sensitive. 
So it adds a, a level of difficulty because you cannot see them, but, but still. Uh, I don't want to go into much details, but we use mostly the concept of source receptor sensitivity. So basically it gives dilution factor. If I release one unit of anything here in, in Vienna and I look in, in, um, in Germany and I, I have 10 to the minus 10, for example. So it means that what was released here will be diluted 10 to the 10 times. So it gives you an idea how likely it is. So, so if your detection is, I don't know, one millibecquerel, so it means that at the other end I need 10 to the 10 millibecquerel to, to have, to have the, the same relationship. So the, the dilution factor works in forward or backward, it, it, it doesn't matter. It just gives you a connection between your source and the different uh, lo location. And what we do here, so remember my, my little drawing here, we, we release particles backward in time, what we call adjoint release. So every, for, for, uh, every period of three hours we release and we look back in time. So, so, so at the end you produce, this is your area for 24 hours in the past and this is your area for 48 hours in the past. So as I mentioned earlier, if you know for example that uh, because of the ratio of isotopes that the release was 48 hours ago, then you will look into that region. If you know it was 24 hours ago, it, you will look in, in that other region. And we produce, as I mentioned, we, we produce that continuously and it is always available when the observation are. And then from those SRS, we produce field of regards and possible source region. But the, the, main, the, the main product is the field of regard. So the field of regard is very simple. It gives you all the location where the, where the dilution factor is, is greater than a threshold, threshold. Usually we use 10 to the minus 20. So it is either greater or smaller. So the field of regard, of course, will, will grow in size and time. A possible source region is, is very similar in a sense. It, the, the difference is that you have, is that you have a, a scenario. So you have detection at different location and the, uh, the, uh, the PSR will give you how the fit between the profile of your detection and, and what is forecast by the uh, ATM. So basically you, you add some information and you are able to better pinpoint the, uh, the location of the incident. So those, those are examples of, uh, of PSR. So, so in, in here that's from uh, this station looking 24 hours in the past. So I, I need detection at this station if it happened, uh, if for release in the previous 24 hours will be in that area. So if you go back in time, then the area will be larger and, and larger. So in that case, it is, uh, either on or off, so, so that's binary. So, so it is within or, or not of the area. But you can also uh, produce quantitative. So in, in that case, uh, it, it is a difference between two uh, consecutive time. So it is the increment, it is a, the, the, the differential. So it gives, it gives a little bit more uh, information.
Yeah, this is an interesting case. All, 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 you will see all my cases are interesting. That's, that's how it works. Uh, in, in, in here, what you have is the, the field of regard, the FOR, for two stations, for this station in the Pacific and this station in, the, in Japan. So the pale colors indicate the field of regard associated with this station, and in darker colors is the uh, field of regard for, for Japan, for uh, GPX 38. And so that's one use of this is to have the two together, and you see that in that region, the two field of regard cover the same area. So it adds, to the possibility of having a, a, an emission in that location. And, and by the way, this stars here indicate DPRK. So it is, it is a possibility, uh, and, but as you can see, there are other possibilities, there are other regions where they, this purpose. Because, of course, the atmosphere is diffusive. So as, as you go back in time, the, the size becomes bigger. So this is a field of regard. So you, you can produce that using uh, when you have one or two observation. But when you have more than two observation detection, you can use the concept of possible source region. So, and you, you see in that case, we, we enter different uh, detection and we produce correlation between the profile of those detection and the profile of the ATM. And so that's why you have here a scale from 0.1 to 0.9 being the correlation coefficient. So 0.9, of course, being very high. So, so in that case, uh, you see above 0.9 in here, that orange area where the PRK is, but also at a few other uh, locations, even maybe over Mongolia. So ATM can help answering the question, where does this come from? And of course, for CTBTO, it is a very important, uh, and it is a very important aspect of, of our work. So again, so, in fact, the ellipse that we saw initially, uh, color are not very good here, but the size of the ellipse is your field of regard, and the size of it will indicate uh, the area uh, where an emission would explain your, your detection. Okay. Uh, this is just a, an example, uh, randomly chosen from a case in, the, in Eastern uh, US uh, for a field of regard. So you see, and this is a, uh, for 14 days. You see, as you go back in time, the size becomes uh, bigger and bigger, and at, like it will cover most of the hemisphere within two weeks. Uh, and those, those are produced, uh, as I mentioned a few times, on a continuous basis and always available. So, so this is for a collection stop time of on the 20th, 20th of January. Uh, I mentioned this also for field of regards or for uh, backward modeling. Forward modeling is also interesting to evaluate different possibilities. This is, uh, this is one possibility. Uh, for, for in this case, uh, we have a forward modeling with a release in here. So le le let's say that for some reason you, you think that there could be a release on that date at that time. And usually it would be based on uh, seismic activity, for example. So you, you produce a release, and, and then you look what you would expect to see. And then you, it is possible to, to determine if, if the scenario is, is likely or not. So in, in this case here, we have four different uh, 
forward modeling using uh, NCEP data for our release on the 23rd of September, NCEP data release on the 24th, ECM data on the 24th, and ECM on the 23rd. And we, we look at plume arrival at the GPX38 in Japan. So you see the different possibilities. So the absolute values are not important in themselves. What is interesting here is that, okay, if, if this scenario is likely, then you expect to see something between uh, the 28 at 3 UTC and the 29 at 3 UTC. And then not much. So, so, so this is useful information to decide. Uh, and, and then if you, if you have your observations and nothing show up, then you say, okay, my, my scenario was, was not adequate. So I, I will look for a different scenario. Another important use, it was mentioned a few times this morning, is the, the background, the, back, the anthropogenic background I'm talking about here. Uh, you have, for example, medical uh, isotope production facility, uh, with, which will generate all kind of xenon in the atmosphere. You have NPPs, you have research reactors. So when, when you want to decide, is it, is it really a detection from a test, or is it just your background? It is always very difficult. We, we are working in, f to develop uh, very sophisticated techniques to evaluate this. But for now, we have a, a simple but yet uh, efficient technique based on the ETM using the SRS to produce that background. So what we do is we, we have a, a list of all the emitting facilities in the world. And using the SRS is just, remember the dilution factor? We, we just associate dilution factor with, with the site and we can produce a background. So for example, the, the blue stars here are the background as evaluated from ATM. Okay, fine, so what do we do with this now? Uh, for example, there is, maybe there is something here with elevated, that's, that's level B detection at uh, Takaseki. And we have several detection here uh, and other here. So let, let's start with this one. So is it, is it a signal, is it something? Looking at the background, you see that there is a good fit. So those detections are probably just associated with the background. So, so this, this is not, we, we can screen that out. In that case here, background is very steady, very low. And, and yet you have level Bs and a few level Cs. So in that case, since the background is low and constant, ah, this is more likely to be associated with real detection. And the, the same in that case here. So in the future, we want to uh, refine uh, those approaches, but still now we have at least something working to give an idea of the relative importance of the background. Uh, okay, I mentioned that we use uh, mainly field of regard, uh, possible source region, and something I didn't mention yet, when there is a level five, we, 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 we know now uh, what is a level five, it was well explained by our colleagues uh, just earlier. So when there is a level five, we have an agreement, CDBDO has an agreement with the World Meteorological Organization. So they will, different centers, I think we have seven or eight of them, will produce the ATM much the same way as we do. So for those events, we, we, don't, have, we don't have only one or two uh, different ATM, but we can have up to nine, for example. So using all of those uh, simulations, we can combine them and see to which extent they agree. And so it will help refining 
uh, our conclusion. So, so this is this is a very powerful approach. So it is, it is what we call a, the multi-model approach. It's been uh, going on for 15 years now, I think. Uh, it is it is very efficient. We send a request and. Uh, within 24 hours, we have all the results. Uh, something different, data fusion. There are, we have uh, different possibilities re regarding this, and we, uh, we'll, uh, I will show a few of them. Uh, I just mentioned the background assessment. Okay. Uh, and. And now, how do we look at all those data? We have, we have a, uh, a tool called WebGrape. Uh, it is the IDL-based software, and it works on many different uh, platforms. And we can manipulate all the animation you've seen so far, the images are produced uh, using WebGrape. And, and this, this uh, WebGrape is available to all the, uh, the state uh, so, so that's that's what we use. This is an example of uh, web grid interface. Uh, I mentioned the field of regard FOR, plume is forward modeling, uh, PSR, multi PSR, multi uh, four, and, and so on. And grid, you can uh, show your your your, your uh, meteorological data. Uh, and you have data fusion, plus uh, a few other uh, functionalities. So, so it works uh, very well, uh, and it is available to all the state. And there is a new version. Uh, my colleague Yolanta has been working on this for for a while. So, the idea is, it it is available anywhere. Uh, if you can log on the on the web on the web page and you can use a web group, IBS. It, 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 yeah, and, and the look and feel is, is very interesting. Data fusion. So the idea is to, to try to match different technologies. If you have a detection uh, from, uh, if, if, you, if you have an event, SHI event, a seismic, for example, and you, you have a detection, how can you combine those two together? So let's say uh, you have your uh, RN station here, and this is a plume. It is not a typical plume that you will see, but let, let's, say, let's say it is your plume. And you have an, an ellipse here associated with a uh, suspect event. So in the backtracking mode, okay, there is an overlap in that region. So it, it means that it is possible that this even triggered a detection here. So by combining different technologies uh, like this, then it adds to, to the power. So there is a link between uh, this and this. Uh, in, some, in some cases, of course, could be no overlap, so, so this, this RN is not detection, I mean, is not linked to any uh, seismic event. But in that case, uh, you have two different detection and the, the two of them overlap with the uh, seismic event here. So, so in that case, then you would have, uh, you increase the likelihood of a real event. In the past, uh, the past, up to now, we look uh, seven days in, in backward, but the new version will go uh, 60 days in the past. So this is the data fusion tool. <coughs> okay, most at the end. So ATM is very good to relate RN measurement to a source area, and we do we do this mainly by backtracking, by trying, okay, we, where does this air come from? Uh, and by answering this question, you can identify your source area. 
So backtracking mode is the most efficient. Uh, we discussed briefly of the SRS concept, which is more or less associated with a dilution factor. Uh, and the, those SRS, and from those SRS file, you can uh, produce the field of regard and DPSR. Um, and in, in forward mode, ATM is used to forecast where the plume of radioactivity will uh, arrive in, in the next days, for example. Yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. I'm Stephen Hartzog from the United States. And my question is about data fusion. And within the NDC and a box suite of software, can data fusion now be performed by the national data centers with the GeoTool and WebGrape? Uh, or is there another mechanism for doing so? Or is data fusion not yet possible at NDCs within the NDC and a box software? Thank you very much. I don't know. Uh, I know the, the files, the, uh, the, the, those files, the, well, the, the way it works, we associate uh, ATM with, with uh, seismic events, and we create a database, and I'm not sure if that database is uh, largely available. I would suspect yes, but I, can, I will find out for you. Good. So we have a, a longer uh, lunch break. It's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pierre. And as ever, if any more questions occur to you afterwards, we'll be happy to uh, direct them towards Pierre or towards other colleagues. Uh, Right now, we are going to move into what will be a slightly longer lunch break, which is just as well, because I would ask you all to kindly be back for the technical keynote that's going to take place at um, 1.30 p.m. with um, Professor uh, Paul Richards here in this room. Uh, so please do be back for that and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. 